distinct categories um, so that we can uh, discuss what, if anything, we want to do with each of the categories. So uh, 464 has a section um, of the bill regarding data collection. And we do have um, a witness who would like to come in and testify but was not available to do that today uh, with respect to uh, the types of data that is being collected. Um, and so I expect we have some more work to do on that section um, and would be happy to hear suggestions from the committee of other perspectives that you would like to hear from. Andrea, can you remind me of the woman's name? And um, um, yeah. she's from UVM. Stephanie Seguino. Yeah. 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 yeah, and she's yeah. on the um, Racial Equity Commission, is that? Panel. Panel? I think so. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So she, she has some thoughts on, um, on this first section of the bill. And if there are other perspectives that you would like to hear from uh, with respect to uh, data collection, I would be happy to, to hear. <clears throat> Bryn, you can come in and join us. Um, sorry, I should have said that before you actually sat down. <laughs> sorry. But, um, we're just going to have a committee discussion here about the different parts of 464 and also 808 so that we can sort of decide as a committee how uh, how we want to proceed, whose perspectives we want to hear on these different parts of these two bills. And I believe that House Judiciary is going to punt 808 over to us at some mm -hmm. point soon. Okay. But that would require the chair of the committee to remember to do that during during floor proceedings, so we'll see. But um, at any rate, we can talk about both bills. Um, so with respect to data collection, that is the first section of 464. Um, committee, any other uh, perspectives that you'd like to hear, questions that you would like to have answered about the issues around um, the reporting and data? Jim? Did we hear anything from law enforcement that that was any issue that they're they have that information today? We have not. Okay. We have we have a proposal in front of us to uh, to add to um, to the data collection and we can certainly hear law enforcement's perspective on that. Yeah, okay. I mean, I thought I heard the information was collected, just not turned over for this, but I may be wrong in my memory and why. I haven't heard any reason why we shouldn't share it, but if any law enforcement has a concern about that, I guess I'd like to hear it. I haven't heard it. All right. I suspect we have some ears listening who can help us find the right perspectives to hear from the law enforcement side of that question. Um, other questions? Other requests for more information on that? All right, so section two of the bill, I believe, is um, de-escalation and cross-cultural awareness policy. There was, uh, there was a concern that was voiced in committee about, uh, about whether law enforcement officers are trained in cross-cultural awareness. Um, and we heard a couple of examples of why people believe that is, um, that is a problem. Uh, what other perspectives would you like to hear? Um, I think we should hear from the Criminal Justice Training Academy, uh, whatever their proper name is, as to what training in this area they do currently. I heard something about eight hours when we were doing the hearing on mm -hmm. the joint bills, um, but I would be interested to know how much of that covers, and, and if we add the four hours, is that something new, or do, could it have already been done? And also, what's the 
what does that mean? Um, does it increase the academy by a day? Um, whatever. I, I, yeah. I just think we ought to hear from them because they're the our go-to training people. Yes. And there is a proposal to increase <coughs> the training from 16 to 20 hours. Okay, so it's currently 16. Okay. Yeah. State police get an additional seven hours, but we are going to spend right. some time on understanding what that proposal is next week. Okay. Um, so we're not trying to move this out of sync with that testimony. So we will have an opportunity to understand what the proposal is around training. Okay. In the back of my head, buzzing around is somebody talked to me at one point in time at a meeting about the program that Champlain College is trying to implement. Are you doing anything to integrate their, them into the discussion if necessary or appropriate? Um, so I, 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 I think DPS is thinking is well, they would like to work with Champlain College. Um, they don't. They don't necessarily support Champlain College's proposal. changes. That's <coughs> four hours. Yeah. I guess that goes back to your yeah, earlier that, question. Yeah, I, I, I was probably in my mind two and three together. One's the policy, one's the, mm -hmm. yeah, I was yeah. Yeah, lumping them together. So yeah, I mean, the policy and training are uh, <coughs> are separate animals, and um, and I think really should be respected as different okay. different techniques that might be used to to nudge changes if we felt there was something that needed to be changed. Um, so eight oh eight is. Um, <coughs> calls for a statewide use of force policy. Is that, am I remembering that correctly? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so that is uh, in the conversation here as well. And if there's anything more that you would like to hear on, um, on that, I would be happy to entertain. This is the bill that Ian Donahue introduced. Yes. And um, while 464 seems to be focused more on cross-cultural awareness um, and race issues, 808, um, I think, is coming from a, a standpoint of concerns about people who are in mental health crisis. Um, so we're going to merge these ideas and put them all on the table. But I came away from that hearing was that words matter right. and we're talking about a legal standard and there was significant pushback from the folks who are involved in law enforcement today right. as to what that means and when they can use force. Yeah. I think if we're going to pursue conversation, um, the, while we, the Attorney General testified um, I'm not sure what he said. Um, <laughs> so um, I think uh, as our chief law enforcement uh, um, 
officer in terms of prosecuting crimes and defending the state, um, <coughs> we need to flesh that out, I believe, a little bit more uh, if we're going to go down that path of changing the precedent that's been set up through current law and to the courts. Yeah, I think we need a better understanding of what current constitutional law is in this area and yeah. how, if at all, 808 could change that law. Yeah. And especially, and also looking at uh, the definitions um, that are included in 808 and where that language came from, which is California law. Mm -hmm. So, Bryn, is that something that you could prepare to do for us? Absolutely. Um, and again, I, I just want to reiterate that I'm putting these ideas together on the table, but recognizing that uh, training is different than policy, um, and uh, and that we're not we're not necessarily um, bringing 808 into the mix for the purposes of passing that policy, but but looking at the underlying um, where where is our um, our laminated sheet here that says what our legislative right yes so uh, what is the problem that we're trying to solve or what do you hope to resolve with this bill um, I think we have heard concerns from folks in the mental health community um, that you know what they're hoping to resolve with this is um, a better better outcomes when it comes to interactions between law enforcement and people in mental health distress. And um, we have heard testimony that, that you know, you, you don't ever hear about the good, um, you don't ever hear about the positive outcomes, but today in Digger there is a headline that shows um, one of the positive income outcomes, which was, um, Burlington police disarm woman with imitation firearm outside the police station. And this is um, okay. dated February 5th at, at 5 p.m. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that, that, that obviously this story re reads like many stories that we've heard, um, except that the outcome of the story was a positive one where the woman was disarmed and, um, and hopefully gotten connected with some resources and some help. Um, so, other questions, concerns, ideas, thoughts on these two bills um, and all of their associated concepts? They're all on the table. How? I have a thought about 464, and on page 3, um, line 5. Um, the vendor chosen by Criminal Justice Training Council. Um, <coughs> years ago, about 10 years ago, I was involved with an effort called Uncommon Alliance in Burlington. And it was a very interesting collaboration between law enforcement leadership, um, criminal justice leadership, and community members who are advocates and organizers. And the purpose was to try to figure out a process to collect data on police stops based on race. So we spent about two years, and we finally pulled it together, and we were able to come up with a process that law enforcement agreed to, um, to collect data. Yet, law enforcement had the prerogative to choose the vendor that would process the data and report out. So that was Northeastern University who was selected. And what was really surprising for all of us was their conclusion was there wasn't really a problem. Yet the qualitative data was overwhelming, even including my own, because I was um, certainly involved uh, at, at the ground level with this racial profile. So it made us very suspicious of having law enforcement pick out the vendor, which actually turned out to be a long time vendor. 
that had a long time relationship with all these players. So we just felt that there was bias going on there. So how do we prevent that from happening in this process? And I would, I would suggest possibly that the executive director of racial equity be at that table or others to, to participate in making sure we have the right vendor. Because data's data, and you can spin it any way you want. But we knew it was flawed because. I stand by some statistics. <laughs> so I, I think that's a concern for me in this bill as it reads. I think so, just to... <clears throat> well, it's this section, then it goes on, if the, the vendor is not able to, to... Yeah, I was looking at that piece. Is unable to receive, continue receiving data, then the, the, the executive director of racial equity takes over that? Do they have the capacity? Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I, I don't think they do. I don't think so either. <coughs> so I wonder why um, why we have this out in the bill uh, if the vendor is unable to continue receiving data. If you have a vendor, the whole purpose of yeah. the contract you have with them is that they're supposed to be yeah. receiving the data. Or you get another vendor. If you yeah. are not able to, then you're fired yeah. and we'll yeah. find another vendor. <coughs> um, yeah, that's just... Be, yeah. So. Was there more credit to that? Yes, there. there is a history there. For the record, Bryn here from Legislative Council. Um, I, my recollection is that when they were, uh, when House Judiciary was working on this language initially, there were some concerns about the existing vendor um, being able to continue receiving the data. And so they wanted to um, put something in the statute that would provide for an avenue if that vendor could not receive data anymore. I cannot remember who that vendor was. The current vendor is the crime research group. I do not think there's a concern moving forward about them being able to handle that data. Um, so this was legislation that was tailored to a sort of unique circumstance. I just can't remember who the former vendor was. But, but still, then, you know, say, okay, there's a problem with the vendor. We're going to hand it off to the executive director of race equity who has no, no staff, no no staff no. to do anything yeah. like collect yeah. data. It right. just doesn't make sense to me. I yeah. mean, we need to dig into this just a little bit. And um, I guess we should hear from the crime research group and uh, understand what they're doing with the data and whether they, whether they believe there's, there's a more logical home for the out in the event that they can no longer collect the data. Other thoughts, committee? <clears throat> minutes of silent reading here now. If you're, if you're done reading and you would like, you can put your head down on your desk. <laughs> <laughs> can we put our head on the desk? Yeah, I, uh, gently, Rob, gently. For the camera. <laughs> Chair, mm -hmm. do we have a uh, leasing bill coming over from the Senate? Yeah. 
law enforcement bill. There's a really long list of bills that I believe our Senate counterparts are working on. I only ask if mm -hmm. we wanted to add, you know, take one of these bills or part of a bill and amend it on, um, we, we could do that. Yeah. Um, I just, I don't know what the Senate is yeah. doing. I mean, this, this conversation that we're having is going to spill over into the coming days and, and weeks, so yeah. we'll have a better idea uh, we will have time to better understand yeah. the landscape. Do you know if there's moving bills on the Senate side? Um, I, in terms of the Long use portion. of force, in terms of the, the parallel bills to these, I have not uh, been asked to come in and testify about either of the parallel bills in the Senate about these. If there are bills about law enforcement, Betsy Ann would be the person to ask about that. I don't know. surrounding mental health issues. Mm -hmm. are, are there other communities that we should hear from besides people that, that mm -hmm. are confronted with issues of use of force? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Well, I mean that—that's yeah. that was the kind of set of examples that was given with respect to cross-cultural awareness, you know. Right, but um, yeah. um, that is that is an area that I would like to hear more about. <coughs> Excuse me. The the cross-cultural awareness because it, it's honestly not one of those things that I'm understanding. Mm -hmm. The intent automatically. Mm -hmm. Would you like some more examples of the sort of potential miscues that could lead to a misunderstanding between law enforcement and uh, a citizen involved in a, in a traffic stop or? Yes, mm -hmm. I guess that would, that would, would be helpful. Um, mm -hmm. I have some concerns. Section that deals with uh, the adoption of a policy 2368 starting probably in B. There's a lot of discussion about if you don't, then you should, and something gets reported. But there's what page are you on? Uh, excuse me, five. It's four, right? Four and five. Reports being generated, but no expectation of if you don't adopt a policy and then you don't, then you get one given to you effectively and you still don't implement it. Right, yeah. <coughs> you and then I, lose your certification. I don't think that we're at the point where we need to start refining this language. I don't think we're, we're necessarily at the point where we're looking at proposing that we move forward with this language. Right now, I would be more concerned with understanding the concepts that are out there and understanding what other perspectives the committee wants to hear. So I, I think you're absolutely right in terms of that, in parts of that. It's <coughs> difficult to understand and possibly different, difficult to implement. Um, this may be already included in training, but I'm wondering if law enforcement is trained in how to recognize uh, physical illnesses. Um, say, I'm a di diabetic yeah. and I'm stopped 
and someone thinks that I'm driving drunk, but I'm actually having um, mm -hmm. Well, we'll definitely hear from law enforcement. Any other thoughts on this? I, I just wonder if, if uh, the Human Rights Commission can help illuminate some of these scenarios that take place and even get into the cross-cultural piece as well um, in terms of how it impacts policing. We're, we're talking about the woman who addressed us in the joint. Oh, yeah. Well, I thought I remember her saying that she would like disability information put into that and, and that to me just winds up being a no-win situation because you're asking somebody to walk up and start making an immediate assessment about a, a person's disability and how do you how do you ask that question well one of the they're trained to make an assessment of any situation that come up and i think that's the piece we, we haven't heard the details of because they're going to, you know, it's like being a diabetic or being drunk. You, you can, they'll look and they'll see it, the different things. The behavior of cultures, though, are totally different. Now, how do they address that when they walk up to the window and all of a sudden see that it's a different race? It could be Lebanese or something else out there that pointing your finger the wrong way could mean something different. How do they train that type of recognition? So that when they're addressing someone, they're addressing them properly versus being that authority that's, I'm now in control and right. they move wrong and they'll shoot you. Aren't, aren't we asking law enforcement to start racial profiling then? No. What? No. Al, go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, no, no, I think what we're ultimately expecting them to be is culturally intelligent, to have an understanding of all the different cultures that they're going to interact with. As we become a a blacker and browner state, mm -hmm. this is going to be a, a greater concern. Mm -hmm. So if you don't feel comfortable interacting with someone who's different, then you need to deal with that and learn mm -hmm. because it's not going in the other direction. So how do we best support law enforcement to do their best work with people who are different? So if I don't look you in the eye, does it mean I'm ignoring you or disrespecting you, but you may react in a different way, and, and then things escalate. Yeah. All those little nuances. So, just is it is it law enforcement's responsibility to try to have to learn all those different little nuances, or those that are here to learn our nuances or and I don't want to say ours, you know what I'm trying to get at is that our, our culture or our custom has been is that when you talk to somebody you're looking them in the eye so that at least you understand that you're communicating but it, is it law enforcement's job to understand all those different nuances about all the different nationalities or customs or their responsibility to learn more about I guess what would be expected of them. Nelson, do you want to answer that? <laughs> I'm going to answer. In other words, police officers today are trained different in every part of the country you're in right here, mm -hmm. whether in the South or California or up in the Midwest. They're trained differently because of the culture that they're used to that lives around them. Mm -hmm. Somehow they need to get together and understand that the culture now is spreading out everywhere and they all should have some sort of cross-training that meets the needs of each one of those districts, not just one. And just to build on that, I, I, I really see this moving away from training. This is about lifelong learning. Because the more you, 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 you think you know, the more you don't know. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a different mindset. And, and you can learn from your community that you're, you're working with, if you have relationships. So it's training, you know, it's a box, you check it off and you're done. And it's not that, so, because culture is always changing. And the way it is. Okay, so can we, let's, uh, let's 
put a, a hold on this for now. Um, we have a, a list of different perspectives that I'd like us to try to find witnesses to come and share their their thoughts with us on, on these issues, and we'll come back to this next week. Um, so we have a now 10 minute break, uh, because at 11 we have um, folks coming in to talk about H775, or in particular to talk about the After School Alliance in Vermont.